Hello and welcome. I'm Stephen Kuhn and this is going to be our very first NiFi flow. So let's go ahead and get started, shall we? All right. Now, first things first, this is our canvas, right? Our position right now. We are at the NiFi flow, so we're at the root, basically. Now, the very first thing we're going to do is let's look at the data we want to do. This flow is going to involve taking a CSV file or a text file and move it, taking it from a root directory and taking it all the way into, in this case, we're going to put it into MySQL, into a database, into a table there. Now, this could be something that you do at work. I know I have to do this sometimes at work, and sometimes I get data from sources that output files, and this is, this is the only way I can get that data instead of a more convenient way, right? I'm pretty sure a lot of you have been there too. So let's go ahead and build this one out. So we, we could start with just with the processor real quick and go ahead and put our first step in here. But what we're going to do is this is our main canvas, right? So I want to create a process group because I want to put all this in one spot. Now let's go look at the data before we get any further. So this is on my server. This is my data directory where the, I'm storing the data right now. Let's go ahead and list what we have here. And what we have here are several CSV files and all they have is dates. Uh, some, so the bottom, the top ones right here, uh, uh, 2018-01-03. So this is month one to three. This one's four to five. This one's too big from the source I was getting from, and they only let me pull down like 20,000 records or something like that at a time. So this one only has one month again, one month again. This one has two months in it, eight, nine, or three, eight, nine, ten. And then this one has two months in it for 2018, it rounds up 2018, right? When I got 2019 for this data, for these CSV files, there's one per month. Now this may seem really weird, but we can actually just take this the way it is and take this all in. And you'll see how we do that in NiFi. Now, pref preferably you would rather have a standardized naming scheme for your files that you're trying to bring in. That way you can set things up to be more precise, right? But uh, let's just take a look at it. We have varying sizes of files as well. So let's see what this file or this data is. So we'll cat the first one, or we'll cat a small one. Uh, well, it's just that last one right there. Okay, see there's a lot in here. Let's go ahead and go all the way back up the top real quick. So what this is, is uh, this data came from the USGS website for earthquake data. And basically this is, I what I pulled down was uh, all earthquakes for the time period they were looking at here, uh, which is 2019, month 12, so December. So all earthquakes that had a magnitude of two or greater. And there you go, you can see we have Puerto Rico in there, Oregon, Alaska, Philippines. And they there is a header in here, we can see that right there. And then we have our data down below, right? So this is what we want to get from our source. Some For some reason, they provided the data to us this way. And we need to get it so that we can put it into a database. And let's see what we have to do in NiFi to make that happen. Okay, let's go back now. So we're gonna call this USGS CSV data. All right, and then we have this process group. It has some detailed information on it, but none of that's relevant right now. Let's go ahead and double click on that. And if you look at the bottom, you can see we went, we're inside of, uh, from NiFi flow, or root basically, we're inside of USGS CSV data. And now we have another canvas, brand new, right? So let's go ahead and begin. So first thing we want to do is let's grab a processor. And the processor we want to use in this case is going to be, oh, my bad, there we go. The processor we're going to use in this case is going to be get file. So let's do a search real quick. Now, you can see from the screen, there's 286 total processors that are native to Apache NiFi. You can sort by groups, like say you made your, so one cool thing about NiFi is you can make your own custom processors. Will require a little bit of programming, right? But once you have it built, and you build a processor that can take in flow files and give you the output you're looking for, and they manipulate the data in such a way that you need it to be done, you can turn that into a full-fledged processor for NiFi, and it can be added to the list here, and it would show up. So first things first. Uh, you got a couple key tags right here. You can do search by if you wanted to. I mean, like CSV. That's one way to do it, right? Filters by anything that has CSV mentioned in the tags. Uh, in this case, I could also do uh, get. 
because I know what I'm looking for. And file, CSV, unfortunately we, want, we don't want to get that, we want to get the file because this is a text file. Now keep in mind, I'm going to do this one way that I'm just doing it this time. But you could probably pull this off a couple different ways or some of the steps we're going to be going through, you can actually probably do them in a couple different ways as well. So it's not like this is the one true way to do things. So let's go back there real quick though. So get file. Now if we highlight over it, click it, we get a description of what it does. Creates flow files, excuse me, creates flow files from files in a directory. Now if I will ignore files, it doesn't have at least it doesn't have at least read permissions for, so it can't touch those basically. And here it is right here. So it's called the title right now for this processor is get file. It's and you see in the gray down below it, it's the get file 1.11.1 processor. You can see it's org.apache.nifi, nifi standard NAR. And NARs are basically the packages that processors are built into. Let's go ahead and open it up so we can configure it. Now you can double click on it, you can right click on it, and when you right click on it, you see you have configure, disable, view data provenance, we'll get to that later, history, status history, usage, click on that, brings up a little help thingy, tells me about how to use this, the tags, the properties, uh, what can be changed, what you need to fill out, the relationships, the right attributes, the state management of this file. So there's a lot it will tell you just from here. Not always very uh, well detailed in explaining itself sometimes, but does a really good job. So let's go ahead and uh, right click on again, center view, change color, uh, move the parent group, group, create template, copy, delete. Okay. You can also view the connections upstream and downstream. Let's double click on it again and start using this. So we're gonna say, get, let's give it a new name. It's always good to rename these, get, especially because you'll find yourself using a lot of the same processors sometimes, very, you'll use them often and you wanna be able to search through these sometimes or be able to identify them specifically. So name is gonna be get USGS files. There we go, good enough, just what does it do, right? Uh, we have a penalty duration, don't need to worry about that, a yield duration. And if it errors, what type of a uh, bolt? So if you hover over the question mark, it'll give you a good explanation of what's going on. The level at which the processor will generate bulletins. So warn, debug, info, error, none. And you'll see the bulletins a little bit later. Probably if we, don't, if we mess something up, you'll see a bulletin. So we have scheduling. How often does this run and how does it run? Scheduling strategy, we have a couple options here. If we hover over it, it gives us some <laughs> a quick little brief description. Right now it's set for timer driven, means run schedule is set for zero seconds. So this will basically run as long as it sees something that do. We also have current tasks. This tells us how many instances of this one processor we want to run in parallel, or run at one time, right? And then execution. This is uh, basically if you had a NiFi cluster built, you would tell it, is it running on all nodes? Can they all run this processor? Or is it just the primary one? And the primary one will be, that option is really good when you're in a cluster and you're running a cluster. Uh, when you have very, like, maybe I want to send an email out every time I do something and that's uh, my last thing is to send that email. Well, I don't want, what'll happen is if I say concurrent task one, every processor will run this process, or my bad, every cluster, every server in the cluster will run this one time. So technically, if I had a cluster of three machines, three servers running NiFi, this would actually be getting run, would run three times in parallel, one for each of those servers, or one for each instance of NiFi. Now, I may not want to spam people with three emails, so in that case, I would say probably your node, because I only want this task to be run one time by this primary node, if this is the primary node. Maybe it's a different one, right? So leave that on all because we're doing one instance right now. So we're not in a cluster, so it doesn't matter. No, it's not applicable. I also have stuff like cron driven. So I can put that in there and put a cron time in here. And if you don't know how to use cron time, you can go to some like cron, who was it, maker? Nope, so that wrong, cron maker. So you can tell it, maybe I want to run something hourly. Every one hour starts at 12 or whatever, right? If I want to change that, say generate, here's your cron format, 
take that, you can copy that, and then you can paste it directly into here. Voila, now it's gonna run on that schedule. But in this case, we're gonna do timer. We are gonna do, let's say every five seconds right now, because we're building this out our first time. So we kinda wanna be, I like to make sure I put time in there. Normally I put like 300 seconds, because I don't want it to run everything. So I want it to give me one flow file or one instance of whatever I'm trying to do real quick so I can see what the output was and I can work through this and test it as I go. Properties. So these are the properties for this specific processor. So we have an input directory, which is the where this processor will pull the files, as it says in the description there. We have a filter. If we want to create a specific filter for what we're looking for for file-wise, we can do that too. The path filter as well, so you can see which re, uh, re, when recurse subdirectors is true, then only subdirectors whose path matches the given regular expression will, will be scanned. The batch size, so in this case, the batch size is the maximum number of files to pull in each interaction. So this could pull 10 files at one time for the one interaction. Uh, so depending on what you're trying to do and how you're trying to control this, depends on if you want to control, uh, change that. We also have keep source file. In this case, I'm gonna say true for right now, whoops. The reason being is I don't wanna to have to go replace those files as soon as I run this one time. Uh, if it's set to false, then what it's gonna do is delete that file. Once it pulls the file in, it will delete the file. So if you have, maybe you have a vendor or some third party or someone external to you, right? The only thing you can give them access to is this folder. And you say, okay, send me your stuff, drop it in a, drop it as a CSV or text file or whatever, drop it into this folder, and then this process, I will have my stuff go out there, collect that data, bring it in, but I want it to delete it so it doesn't go and recollect the same thing over and over. So that's what you can use that for. Recurse subdirectories, if you have a main root and you want it to go through all those subdirectories to get, grab all the data in there, you would say true. Uh, polling interview, so we don't have a subdirectory in this case, so I'm not worried about it. Polling intervals, so we have a couple of different things in here. Some cool things is also the uh, ignore hidden files, so you can do hidden files. The minimum file age. So the minimum age that a file must be in order to be pulled. Any file younger than this amount of time will be ignored. So that's pretty cool. Maybe, maybe a file name gets created. I don't know, you could have an instance where the file gets created, it's a skeleton file, and you know after X amount of hours or something like that, that it finally gets populated. Maybe something like that. Or you could use the file age for the maximum as well. And you can use size as well. So maybe that skeleton file gets created, it's got nothing in it, so it's a zero for file size. And you know once it gets past, you, you feel confident enough that once it gets to a certain size that it's good enough to grab that file. So it gives you some flexibility on what you can do there. In this case, Let's go ahead and put our directory in there that we want to get the files from. And this is where mine's at. So this is basically the, for me, this is the uh, path inside the container I, I'm running NiFi in for Docker and the directory I created inside that where I have data being stored. All right, and the next thing we want to do in this case is we're gonna say batch size, uh, let's go for one right now. We can always change that later. And then keep source file true and thing we're good for everything else. I don't have anything else I want to do. And at the end of every processor, you always have the ability to add comments if you want to enlighten someone else who might be using this. Okay, apply. So we create our very first process. This is step one for us. Let's go ahead and move on to step two. So what we can do is test this. Let's see if this processor works, right? So we can't test it unless we have the outputs going someplace. So let's go ahead and grab and what I normally use is like a, eh, I like to use a weight processor. I mean, it doesn't, it can be any processor because we're not gonna do anything with it. Now, how you connect processors, you click on the middle one, you drag it and connect it. You get a green line, you, it says create connection. We're creating a connection for the success relationship in this case. It tells us a little bit about it as well, to processor for weight and from processor inside of what group. Just click add, you're done. There's also the settings as well if you wanted to play with those. Let's go ahead and go back to that real quick so you can just see it. So you have stuff like we can name the connection. 
we have flow file exploration. So flow files could sit inside of this queue because once we make the connection, we have a queue as well between the two processors. And we could say all these flow files, anything in the queue expires after X amount of time, seconds, minutes, hours, doesn't matter. We also have what's known as back pressure object threshold. So in this case, this is how much will be stored, maximum number of objects that can be queued before back pressure is applied, meaning it won't put anything else in the queue. We can also control that by total flow files or the size itself, or a combination of both. And then we have load balancing. So if we were running in a cluster, we could use a strategy where it does partition by an attribute that we set up around Robin or a single node. And then priority. Maybe we want to set a priority, like first in, first out, prioritize. It's always going to be that way. That could be our priority. Or maybe we always want the newest flow file first instead of the oldest, or make sure we always get the oldest first, right? And you can actually set up a combination and depend on how you're trying to do this. So there you go. Let's go ahead and create that. We have our connection done. Now we have Q in the middle, right? Uh, one cool thing that you might want to know, because uh, it was cool when I figured this one out, uh, you can double click on the connection line there. It creates another point. And then say I'm trying to make space or organize this better. I can say, uh, I want my queue to sit over here because I want to keep these close by to each other, not on top of each other like that, but next to each other. It's easier maybe to read. I can see flow files come out here, they hit here. That's where they go. Arrows, points, tells me what's going on. But for right now, let's just move it down below and just keep it right here. But we can tighten it up a little bit, right? There we go. So we see our flow. We have two things going on. So what we can do is... This one we don't have to worry about because we're just trying to test out the first one. So let's go stop right now, right click on it, say start. Refresh, now I'm gonna stop it real quick. And you can see we have one flow file in the queue. That flow file is 622.34 kilobytes. And we can see in, we're at zero right now, so nothing coming in, read write. How many went out right now within the last five minutes? And this is in five minutes, you can see over here. So let's go ahead, what we can do is a couple things. We can right click on the processor, say data providence. And this shows us everything that's gone into this processor in the last X amount of time. Uh, now providence is normally set up uh, inside of your DiFi configuration. And you set for how long you want things to stay in providence so they don't just continue to take up memory, right? I think the default is 12 or 24 hours. Can't remember by off the top of my head, but something like that. So I can see the date time it was received on, or when this ran, it was received. Every flow file gets a unique UUID. Tells you the size, the component name that we're in, or that it's being processed in, uh, that this line was processed in. And then the component type, which is a Git file, right? I can also go here and see, show me the lineage, and I can go to, right? So maybe I was somewhere else, this would show me I could go here, I see I received it, and then it went into the next one. The receive is that one. I can navigate two things, I can download, I can go back to the list. So what's more important here though is I can go ahead and click on the info button here, and I can see details on this flow file. So we have the detail session, tells me about how big it was, what type of interaction this was, does it have parent flow files, is it a child flow file, all that type of little details here. Uh, I can see the transit URI, but what I'm really looking for is these two that are most helpful to me, unless I'm trying to troubleshoot something over here. Attributes. So every flow file has an attribute. Basically think of it like kind of headers, right? On a packet. <laughs> That's how I think about it when it comes to networking. And um, in there, you have these, he or these attributes, and here's our attribute values. And we can see we have absolute path. So this is where we got it from. So it created this attribute by itself. The creation time of this flow file. Uh, the file.group, if that was important. File owner. So you can see the information about the system, the permissions on that file. So a couple of things here. The file name that it was. And basically, these attributes are going to stick with this flow file as it moves around. You can add more attributes to it using certain processors. You can take away attributes from it. And you can utilize attributes when you're doing certain processes as well. We'll see some of that later. Now let's look at content. Content, in this case, we only have an output because this is a new flow file that got created in this processor. 
So under output plane, we have container default, the section, the identifier, the offset, the size, and so forth. I can download this output or I can view it. Let's go ahead and view it. I can click on view and right now we have three view as options. We have original, formatted, and hex. So sometimes like if this was in JSON, it could be in this little string going down there. I could click on format and then that would format it into a JSON format, right? To make it easier to read. In this case, because it's just text and it's a file, we see the same thing we saw when we were inside of Linux and we did a cat on the file, right? We can see the header and then we can see all the lines in this file, which in this case goes all the way down to 34, 55 total lines. So let's go ahead and close out here because this is what we were looking for. We got the file, right? We're happy right now. Close that. We can also go back to attributes real quick. And there is one thing I like. Let's see if it's in here. Oh, it doesn't have the row count in here. Never mind. Does it show up on this one, I think? Okay. Yeah. No, let's not worry about that then. So let's go ahead and close out that. So we know this get file worked. So let's go ahead and right click on or click on this one to select it, the queue. Right click on the queue and say empty the queue. And that will delete that flow file. And now we can't, we can't delete this uh, processor until we get rid of the connection between the two of them. So select it, I can hit delete, or I can select it, right click and say delete too, right? I'm gonna move this over to the side because I might need it later. So the next step is we don't want, so we saw what this had, right? It created one flow file with all the content from that file inside of it. That's not what I want. Uh, problem is I need to turn, so in order to get these for DiFi, in order to get these to go into a database table or into a table, I need to convert them to um, JSON because when we go to our list here and pull a new one out, we have SQL, let's just do a search, and we have put options down here. We can S execute SQL if we want, uh, but we have put, I can put SQL. So let's see what we have here. And if I hover over this, you get the full description there. So put SQL, execute an SQL update or insert command. The content of the incoming flow file is expected to be an SQL, to be the SQL command to ex execute. The SQL command may use question to escape parameters. And in this case, parameters must exist in flow file attributes or naming convention, so forth and so forth. Let's look at this guy real quick, select him. Let's do a view usage on him, and I think he will tell us here. Uh, relationship, attributes, right. Okay, so does it tell us on here? So I already know for a fact, because I use it all the time, that this expects to take in stuff in a JSON format. So JWC connection, eh, we'll get to that later. Batch size, rollbacks, name. Uh, I thought it told us in here. Maybe I'm just missing it for some reason. But I know what I need to connect to this guy. And it needs to be uh, JSON to SQL. This is how I do it all the time, at least. So it's easier for me to remember that way. So convert JSON to SQL. Converts the JSON formatted flow file into an update, insert, or delete. So let's go back, because I need to feed this guy, which creates the statement basically, into this one. So I know I need those two, but I need to turn my flow file into a uh, JSON, right? So one way I, and one thing I want to do is, because I might want to do something to these flow files later. So let's do what's called a split text. Because I want to turn that entire file into one flow file per row. So let's go ahead and go in here and we can manipulate text. So technically this is not a, the flow, the file that came out of here was not a CSV file. It's just text right now. So let's go ahead and do something else with it. Let's do split and we have split text. Splits a text file or text file into multiple smaller text files on line boundaries limited by maximum number of lines and total fragments. And a couple other things. So let's go ahead and take that guy. We want to connect it to him, I know that much. We'll keep that, we're going there. So this will let me take one flow file, you know, make one here, 
and I want to split it into 20,000 lines, whatever the total row count is. So go in there, settings, I'm not changing anything here, I'm still good. Scheduling, yeah, I'm good here. I want it to basically take, as soon as it gets something in the queue, I want it to clear to start processing stuff immediately. Properties, okay, so got a couple of things in here then, right? Now in this case, line split count. How many lines do you want? The number of lines that will be added to each split file. In this case, I just want one. I want one flow file per, one line per flow file. Next one, fragment size. We're not using fragments here. Uh, header line count. So basically does this have a header? If so, how many lines is the header? So in this case, it's one. And remove trailing new lines, true, Let's just do that to clean things up. So we should be good, this one's pretty simple. And got no comments, got nothing else, done. So now we should be able to say here to here to test it. Now in this case, we're making a connection, we have more relationships available. We have failure, original, and split. In this case, we want the splits is what we're trying, the results we're looking for. We could do something with the original flow file and do something with it. Maybe want to archive it into something, I don't know, a log. Uh, failures would be a good one too. Maybe it failed and we want to send the failures off to a log. In this case though, we're not touching that. We're just doing splits to here, but you can do multiples into the same one. And this says we still have a problem. That's what the indicator here is. Uh, relationship failure or relationship failure is invalid and relationship original is invalid because they're not doing anything, right? So let's go back to them. We're not going to do anything with them right now. So let's go ahead and say failure is terminated, and so is original. Apply. Now we have it in a good state where we can start it. So now I can say, I'm going to start this one, and then, well, how many is 300 seconds? Okay, five minutes. So we'll go ahead and start this one. We saw that full file instantly came out, or it got picked up, or that file got picked up and created into a full file. We're going to say start again, and voila, it already spit out all those lines. So we had 3,454 new flow files created from that one flow file over here. Because we just turned all the lines into something, into separate flow files. Now if we want, we can go ahead and say data providence on the split. And we can see it took in one flow file, so it only has one thing to show. And it has two parts. It did a drop and it did a fork. The fork is the results that we got. The drop is everything else. So we want to see what these flow files look like. We want to go over here, we can do a list on the queue. Now the queue, when you list it, only shows you things that are in the queue at the time that you're doing it. And then we can go to the top one if we want, take a look at it. We have new details that have been added to this one. We have content claim now, a new section here, shows us more information as well. We can view that, and we can see the content now of this flow file. We can see that it has a header, and that it has data on the next line for line two. We can also go to attributes. We can see a couple more things. That the attributes, the original attributes carried over from that one flow file that had everything in it. Those attributes are still being carried over because we haven't done anything to them. So we know this guy came from that original file, 2019-12, right? We can also look through here. We can see a couple other things here. And the UUID and all that good stuff. And now if we go over, oh, you can't do it in here. But we could say view content from here quickly, download the content if you want to download it as a file, and you can do providence. And you can see the providence for this one flow file says, this flow file started off all the way back here, and now it's down here to the fork. So a couple of things to look at right there. Okay, so this gives us one flow file per line. Let's go ahead and empty that real quick. We don't need those. It just proves that it did what we wanted. All right, so our next step is gonna be, we want to convert these. And the reason we want to convert them is, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you something really cool, or a pretty cool processor that I like, because it can do quite a bit. So we're gonna use one, because we need to get these, th this is still text, right? Everything comes out of the split text is still text. And I don't have anything that turns, if I go in here, uh, if I say JSON, because I want to create JSON so I can use it in the other two processors down below. Nothing over here says convert text to JSON. Convert text, uh, I mean, CSV to JSON. Right? Well, actually, there is one of those, if I remember correctly. Um, oh, crap. thought there was. Excuse me. 
Uh, I thought there was a CSV one. Uh, maybe not. Too many. Just can't keep track of all of them. But what I want is I can use convert JSON to SQL, or honestly, I could use the convert Avro to JSON as well. Just depends on which one I want to do. In this case, I'm going to use the JSON because it's uh, a little bit easier, and for what I'm trying to do right now, I, less work involved. Let's say that. So convert JSON to SQL. Well, guess what? I still can't use this yet because this is not JSON. This will take JSON though, so that it can put stuff into S uh, it can take, oh, <laughs> I forgot, we already had that one. But uh, we need to make JSON, right? Because that's what this guy expects for his input. So let's go ahead and use a func processor. And this processor is, trying to remember the name here, convert record, if I remember correctly, record. Uh, there, should be, there it is, convert. Convert records from one data format to another using configure to record reader and record our record write controller services. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll show you what those are in a minute. The reader and writer must be configured with matching schemas. By this, we mean the schemas must have the same field names. The types of fields do not have to be the same if the field value can be co coerced from one type to another. Okay, this is the one we're looking for. And we're gonna connect this one in here. We're gonna say, give me the splits. I don't need anything else. Perfect, I know that step works now, all the way over there. Go ahead and clean this up a little bit. Okay, so let's go to look, let's look at this guy, right? Now we didn't rename split text here. We probably could say uh, split text USGS, just so we know it belongs to this guy. There we go. Go in here, convert records, convert record, uh, text to JSON. That's what we're trying to do. And we don't don't have anything else we need to change in here. Scheduling is fine. We want the process to queue as quickly as possible. Now we have three options in here. We have one called record reader. Click on it. We have nothing in there. Uh, we have record writer. Click on that one. There's nothing in here. And we have include zero record flow files. Uh, in this case, I know I want to say true. Why include something that has nothing in it? For this for this, we don't need it. There's cases where you might want to do something like that. Okay, so we need to create basically a, it takes, these are a reader that reads the schema, which is our text, and outputs it and writes it into JSON format. So this is how we're gonna do it. There's a couple ways to get to what's known as controllers. So I'm gonna click on the canvas here. You can see it says USGS CSV data processor group. So we're back at the group. If I click on this, it's manipulation controls for this guy. So I want to go back to the group. Now we have an option over here called configuration. Let's click on that. Under configuration, we have general. This is where we name things at. And we have controller surfaces. Controller surfaces are where we can go to add a couple extra things that apply to the entire processor or the group, in this case, as a, like a global thing. So we'll click on this. And there's a lot of different things. We'll work on the one we want right now, which is going to be CSV reader. So we can use the CSV reader to parse the CSV formatted data, returning each row in a CSV file as a separate record. Well, even though we're treating our files, CSV files as text so far, they're technically CSV, right? I mean, they do have a CSV, a dot .csv on the end. Just, uh, the CSV, there's nothing that let us do what we've done so far in the CSV category for a processor that I can recall. So let's go ahead and go to CSV Reader. This is the one we're going to use. Now you can see we just added it as a controller service. It's disabled. Let's go ahead and configure it. Click on that. CSV Reader, so we'll just leave that. I can't think of any good name for it right now. And we can actually use this across a lot of things, so let's just leave it. Uh, let's go ahead and go to properties. Now, inside properties, there's a couple of things we want to be able to set up in here. And first thing is going to be schema access strategy. Specify how to obtain the schema that is to be used for interpreting the data. We could infer that doesn't always work out. You want to test that if you're trying to use it. There's a couple other options in here. Use schema text property. Uh, a couple other ones, confluent. So you could have a schema repository, basically, stuff like that. In this case, though, we can say use string fields from header. 
because there's a header. Let's go ahead and click on that. If we had a schema registry and stuff like that, that had a predefined templates for the schemas and stuff, we could put the registry information in here. Uh, we could provide the schema name, the version, the branch, and all that good stuff. And that would apply the schema to this CSV reader. But we don't have one and we're gonna go simple. So we're gonna say a string fields from header. And the next thing we want to change is, we don't have to change anything else right now. We can go down here though, so you see parser, that's gonna stay the same. Uh, and you see here, so I specify which parser you use to read CSV records. And we're gonna use the Apache common CSV. Date format, time format, things we can change or update if we want to. Uh, so I like to use when I create CSV files, I actually don't like to use the commas. I like to use the bar, but in this case, we're gonna use the comma, just because the bar is less used by most things I use. Uh, and I see commas in a lot of data I use. So unfortunately it doesn't help me. Okay, so we'll leave that alone. And we wanna say treat first line as header. Well, that's true, right? All of our flow files have a header now. So we're gonna say true. And we should be good. Trim fields, uh, true, why not? Whether or not white space should be removed from the beginning and end, I mean, Normally I do this at some point, why not do it now? And you can say stuff about null strings too, specify as a string format. So you can consider how you wanna treat nulls. And I think we're good for everything else. You have the quote character option still in here. So we'll just leave that as the default and hopefully it will be applicable to what we're doing. Let's say apply. Now we have that created, we can turn it on. Click on enable. And we can say service only or service and reference components. So if we had a whole bunch of components, processors made that were using this guy, they would be listed here. And you could say, don't just turn on this uh, controller service, turn on everything that, because everything else stopped when we turned it off. So turn on everything that is referencing this guy so that they're working again too. In this case, we don't have anything. So we just say enable and it should go through with no problem. Got a check mark. Looks good over here, says enable, got a blue thing. Now let's go ahead and create another one. We need to create a writer. So the one we're looking for is gonna be JSON. We're trying to write JSON. So what do we have there? We have JSON record set writer. Writes the results of a record set as either a JSON array or one JSON object per line. That sounds about what we're looking for. Let's go configure that guy. And uh, we can actually get away with quite a bit here that we don't need to do. <laughs> we just want it to default and give us the JSON value after it writes it out. And I'll put grouping array, sure, why not? One line, either one works for us in this case for what we're gonna be doing. So we can actually stick with this. We can do the pretty print JSON if we want, uh, suppress no values if you'd like, compression if you wanna do something like that. If we had a very specific schema, are we, we could use that, we could still use those options, right? Like create it into a certain type, use a schema to build the JSON for it. But we don't need to, not in this case, not for what we're doing. So let's go ahead and enable that guy. And it's working. Okay, so this is the controller services, let's leave this. Now, this control, these controller services we just built only apply to anything inside of the, CS, the USGS CSV data group that we create, that we're working in right now. So it doesn't, if I go back up to NiFi flow, I go up to the higher level here, and then I click on configuration, I don't see those controller services here. They only exist inside of that one, so they're only usable that inside there. If I built them out here, then that means if I did at the flow level here and I built them here, then they would be applicable to everything that's lower in the hierarchy, right? So they would automatically be inheritable by these guys. But this lets you kind of compartmentalize things a little bit and try to keep things a little clean. Okay, so we have that built. Let's go to convert record. And underneath the convert record here, we want to pick our reader, which is our CSV reader because we didn't give it anything fancy for a name. JSON record set writer, got that one in there. Apply, we're good to go. Now let's go ahead we know the next one we're gonna be looking at is gonna be that JSON to SQL. So let's go ahead and just connect it there. Said success will go over there. Uh, we were getting an error because our 
we don't have a termination on the failures. Let's go ahead and terminate them because I'm not going to write them to a log or anything like that. Not for this. Clean it up a little bit. And now we can say, oh, <laughs> this has been getting files this entire time. Forgot I didn't turn that off. Okay, I want the timer to restart on this, so I'm going to say stop, refresh, make sure everything looks good. Start that one. I'm going to stop it real quick. We got one in the queue. That's all we need. Start this one. It's done its job. And I'm going to start this one to convert the records. And voila, the same amount that went in came right back out. We have 100% of them converted over. Let's go ahead and take a look at them in the queue because we can look at them there. Uh, go ahead and click info on it. We can see the attributes on here. More attributes get tacked on as you do things here and there. Let's go to details. Under de details, we can do content claim again, and we can say view. Now we have this long line here. Let's go ahead and format it, and here we go. We have a JSON key value pair for everything that was in our text. So we created a JSON string here that we can use for our next processor and what it needs. So you see the time, latitude, longitude, depth, magnitude, magnitude type. So we have all that in here, right? Let's go ahead and close this window. Say okay and close. So excellent, we've been able to convert this over. Yeah, we had to do a couple steps, but honestly, it's really fast. I mean, here we go. We'll just say empty the queue. There we go. All empty, say start, and it's already done. I mean, that was really fast. That's why it's pretty cool. It can scale up, and we're only running, let's look at this. So we have scheduling. We're only doing one thread of this. Same thing here, one thread. Same here, one thread. This was pretty easy volume for what we're doing, yes, but it's only one thread right now, so it's not like we're putting in, we're not processing a lot of data where we have to increase the thread count so that they can keep up or they can process in the time that we would like them to process in. So now we have the data at the next step in the queue, right? And we are at the convert JSON to SQL. Let's go ahead and double click on that. And we're gonna say convert JSON to SQL. Yeah, don't need to change it really. We'll just stick with that for right now. It is better to name them more specifically, but we'll leave it like that. Okay, under the properties for the convert JSON to SQL, first thing we have is a JDBC connection pool. So specifies a JDBC connection pool to use in order to convert the JSON message to a SQL statement. The connection pool is necessary in order to determine the appropriate database column types. So this is what it uses to say, hey, um, I'm connecting to say a Teradata database. This is the format syntax that I need to build, use in order to build this connection or to build this statement, right? So that's what it's saying there. In this case, we don't have anything on our list because we haven't built a connection pool yet. Uh, we have statement type. We're gonna be doing an insert, but first of all, let's go fix the first problem we have right here. So I showed you that you could do from here, right? Click on this again, do configuration. Another way to get to it from inside the processor is when you click on it, say create new service. And then it gives you a list of compatible controller services. In this case, we want to do a DB, DBPC connection pool. Click on that one, give it a name if you want. In this case, I will give it a name. I'm gonna call it, um, let's see, this is going to be my SQ, oops, too many keys, my, my SQL, my SQL, uh, my database is going to be USGS database, uh, database. Okay, and nothing else here, just some more information on this. Say create. And now we see that it got created and we can go to it. So we can jump straight to it instead of going back out and going to configuration. Jump straight to it. Uh, save the changes before control services, yes. We jump out here and you see back in our control services list, we have a new one in there called the MySQL USGS database. And I'll give you an example of that real quick. So here's the beaver, oops, it's over there. Okay, so back in the beaver, I already have on my Docker, I have a Docker version of my SQL server set up. 
and it's running. And under that, I have databases, and I have one called USGS, and I have a table that I've already made called earthquakes. When we look at that table down below, you will see I have one field, one column for every single thing in the header for all the fields inside of those field files. Now, in this case, I'm just going to be very generic with them. So when I created these, I just said, hey, Varchar 100, because I want to just get them in here. I'll do something with them or I'll be more specific about the column and data types later. Right now, we just want to get this to the end. So let's just see if we can make it work. Okay, so let's finish setting up the MySQL USGS database. And let's go over here, click on configure. So first thing we need to do is provide a database connection URL, right? So you want to figure out what that is for your server connection that you're trying to get to. In this case, I know my IP. And so in this case for my SQL, it's JDBC, colon, my SQL, colon, IP address, port, colon, port. And you can do port slash USGS or the table or the database name if you want. You could leave that out too if you wanted to. Uh, it's not necessary. And then driver class is going to be in this case for the JDBC connection for MySQL is com MySQL CJ JDBC dot driver for the driver I'm using. And I need to tell NiFi in this case, where does it find the driver? So I sp specifically have a folder in, on the NiFi server. And this is where I put all, inside of one called custom dash nars, that's where I put all my drivers, my JDBC drivers. So that's where it knows to go find it. And then database password, I do have a password uh, or a user, created one just for this could be connect to it called NiFi user. And I did create a random password at a nothing and that is, where was that? There it is, random nothingness. Doesn't matter. And let's look at the other information we can provide now. So max wait time. So this is the max amount of time that the pool will wait for a connection to be returned before the fell, right? So in this case, five milliseconds. Max connection type. So this is how many, for this connection type we're creating, this connection pool for this uh, cert specific connection we're creating, this is how many connections it can make simultaneously to this database or this server for this connection. So it can have, in this case, it's default is eight, so it can create eight different instances where it can connect at once. That's good to know because you can't you can't thread this more than eight times because it won't be able to do, it won't be able to connect more than eight times. Unless you bump up the number yourself or make it infinite, which you can do by negative value. Uh, validation query. Sometimes you might want to put in a little query there that validates the connection. That's always possible. Or prevents it from getting dropped, right? Maximum idle, maximum icon. So if you have really long, really the only time I ever use like uh, minimum idle or idle connections or maximum lifetime, stuff like that, is when I'm doing very big queries out of something and it just takes a while to run. So really the rest can just stay the same. Let's apply that and turn it on. And as long as I got everything correct, it should work. Let's go ahead and close that and close that. Okay, so we need to go back into this guy. So we have the, we're pointing it to the connection pool that we created just for this. The statement type we want it to build is a insert statement into the table. The table name, uh, let me go remember what I call that table name. Let me look here. Table name is called earthquakes. Uh, we know the catalog is USGS. There's no schema name to worry about for MySQL. Okay, so translate field names. If true, the processor will attempt to translate JSON field names into the appropriate column names for the table specified. So uh, normally that's default, it works just fine. What's it do when it finds unmatched field behavior? Huh? Ignore unmatched fields. In this case, if it cross one, comes across one it doesn't recognize, it doesn't matter. Uh, so it'll just work with what we have. Unmatched column behavior. So in this case, it says fell on unmatched columns. So if we don't have a column that matches, then it's going to fail. We could say 
ignore it or warn on it and keep doing things. So you can always have do that. Update keys, we're not using a key in this case, the index or anything like that to do it inside an update. If we were doing an update in here, we would want to have update keys and tell it which column is our key so it can find the right ones or whatever we're using to match the data, the data in the flow file to the row inside the table that we're trying to update, right? All right, and then basically SQL primer attribute prefix, well, you'll see that in a little bit. We're just gonna leave it at SQL and say apply. We need to make the connection. We're gonna bring over SQL. And let's terminate fell and original because we're not gonna do anything with those and you see that we have a connection. And then put SQL as our last step here. So let's go ahead and open that one up. We'll leave it alone. We'll say put SQL into earthquakes. Or we could say usgs.earthquakes. Oh, whoops, why did I leave that? <laughs> so now we know what it's doing. Scheduling, we'll leave it the same. We'll leave it on one thread. Okay, so all we have to do here is pick the same connection we're using. We don't have to do anything because we're not doing, we already have the statement being created by the other guy, so that's okay. We're good there. But a JSON one, it's just going to pass it through here. And then we have stuff like transition or transaction timeout, batch size. It's going to insert, if it has 10,000 in the queue, it's going to insert 100 at a time for each uh, commit it does. In this case, let's bring it up to 1,000. Nothing, I mean, really, it's, you can basically set the batch size up, size up to be, that's the maximum batch it will create. But um, when you have that set up, it will, you can use that to kind of optimize, like what's the preferred batch size for doing a, like a batch update into your table or insert into your table, right? Sometimes smaller might be good, sometimes bigger might be better. Okay, and the rest we don't have to worry about. Fill, roll back on, on failure, nah, we're just gonna leave that alone. So apply, this one just needs a couple relationship things handled. So when it fails, we want to just terminate retry, or retry. We'll leave alone, and if it succeeds, we'll say go ahead and terminate. We won't. We don't want to do anything that apply. Now, what happens if it has a retry come out, right? So we can say in this case, retries just reprocess back into yourself, loop around. So when you go retry, a flow file is routed to the relationship if the database cannot be updated by attempting to attempting an operation again may succeed. So maybe the table's locked, right? That might be a reason for a retry. That way it can still get the data in there and we don't lose it. Or nothing just happens with it. Okay. So we already check, we already verified the table's empty. And let's go ahead and take this data. Move it on to the next processor. Okay, that one's a little bit slower, but it still made them pretty quickly. So it made all those. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. What did it do to the flow file? So let's look at one of them. Nothing really changed here. Click on view. Oh wow, what's this guy? So we have a long line. So hey, this looks like an insert statement. That's what it did. It made an insert statement, right? Now the values are all question marks. And the reason for that is the values are now a part of the attributes. So if we scroll down here, look for that prefix of SQL, like it said, right? Here you go. SQL argument one type 12. SQL argument one value. Here's the value for it. So that's what that processor did. It created these attributes for the values that need to be inserted into the statement. So that's what happened inside of ConvertJSON to SQL. Now we have those flow files. And then this one will put them inside the database. Voila, all done. Those just inserted into the database. Go here real quick. And here's all of our data. Granted, it's all inside here as varchars, but we got it in there, we made it work, and our data is where we want it to be. Now let's go ahead and come back out here and tell this guy, change him from scheduling of that. Let's just say, you know what, consume everything in there and go ahead and write it. Start it. Ooh, whoa, that wrote, <laughs> that did too many. <laughs> oh, I forgot, it's not deleting though. <laughs> Let's go ahead and empty what's left in there. Oh, there it is. 
Okay, we didn't get all of them, but we got some. But you, you already see it move data pretty quickly. Look at those slow files. I mean, moving thousands at a time. We're hitting our back pressure right there. But hey, it just worked. So in that little instance there, because we looped through those files like crazy, if we come back out here, we can get a count of how many we just inserted into here. 44,902. That was really fast. And it processed all those steps in basically a heartbeat there. Now, let's go ahead and change this up a little bit. Now we want to say configure again. And let's go ahead and do the keep source file. No, this is a completely built out process flow. It works. So we don't need to keep those anymore. And say we felt like um, convert record was taking a little bit too much time. So let's go ahead and stop, stop, stop. And let's say, you know what, you can have five total. Make yourself, you can run five consecutively. Same thing there. We'll leave this one alone. All right. So let's just turn those back on. And now we can go ahead and let's just truncate that table real quick. Okay, it's all empty now, so we can just put it in the data that we want. And we should be able to get through this pretty quickly here. Oh, wait, we have this on one, right? Yeah, back size one. We don't need to do that. We can do, let's go with 10. Now, what this will do, though, is this will consume really quickly. This will process. We're probably going to get back pressure on one of these queues. But we try, We just now, we're trying to alleviate that because we're doing five, five, and five here, right? or five and five these are the slowest ones so let's see if we get any back pressure on this let's go ahead and start there you go refresh refresh we got a little bit right here for the insert statements because it only processes okay so the reason that's happening because we're only processing uh a thousand at a time but let's just play around with this real quick we can optimize it we can balance it out differently we see we have three two cues are full that one's full too now. <laughs> okay, so what I could say is we know we can do eight total over here. So let's just say, you know what, do eight. Now, depending on how you have locking and stuff set up, it may not be a good idea to do that. Maybe just doing bigger batches is a better idea. We could say, come back here. You know what, stay one, one on this one. But let's go ahead and process a much bigger batch. Maybe 10,000 at once. Go ahead and start that and we can see things flow through. Now you can see that it's taking a little bit of time to run. So it's running as quickly as it can. So it might just be taking a little bit of time to write into that MySQL database, which is possible because uh running inside of a container and I didn't really optimize it or anything. I just throw it up real quick so we can have some place to put this stuff. And this is, oh, more importantly, this is, as it ran through everything, let's go take a look in, uh, ls to sell. There you go, it's taking everything out of the directory and it deleted all of them as it did it. So we can go ahead and go back to this guy because it's not gonna do anything else anymore until you drop another file in there has three more waiting to get processed. Things are being held up a little bit. Oh, whoops, <laughs> I may have crashed it on accident. But that's gonna be just cause I was forcing too much at once. Okay, more importantly though, that was our entire flow. It worked from beginning to end. And what we're gonna do in the next video is go ahead and take that and process, or we'll extend onto the current flow we have and make some more changes, do some more things with it and see how we can manipulate the data. Those flow files that are in, in the middle of the flow, we can add a couple extra processors that can do some manipulation to it. Maybe trim out some stuff we don't need, keep some stuff we do want, and you'll see what we can do there. So I'll catch you next time in the next video. Have a good day.